The search for the living continues this morning, one day after the world watched two hijacked planes slam into the World Trade Center, causing the towers to tumble and killing thousands. In Washington, hundreds are feared dead in a similar fiery plane crash at the Pentagon. All this as President Bush vows to hunt down the terrorists and bring them to justice. It's early this Wednesday morning. It's the 12th of September, 2001. From New York City, this is a special edition of The Early Show, Attack on America, with Bryant Gumbel and Jane Clayson. It's the morning after the attack on America. It's September the 12th, and this is a Wednesday morning like no other. I don't know if we can stress that enough. I don't know if we can accurately characterize just how eerie and the stunned disbelief that pervades the city you right see now. see those pictures over and over again, and you think back, it was just 24 hours ago exactly. that we were reporting this for the first time, and we didn't know what had happened. We first saw that plane go through that first tower of the World Trade Center. Yeah. In fact, as you know, 24 hours ago, we, we approached this, uh, we seemed to have a great deal of optimism. All we saw was that there was an accident at uh, one of the World Trade Center buildings. At that time, we naively thought that perhaps it had just been a small plane that had gotten sidetracked and it had an unfortunate accident. But and then when that second plane came in... This is the one that convinced the world that, no, this was no accident. As you can see, it was a, uh, a clear day, and that second plane plowed in at... Um, at uh, 9.03, about 18 minutes after the first one, and then it was 9.43 when a third plane hit the Pentagon, and 9.50 when the uh, South Tower collapsed, and uh, 10.29 when the North Tower collapsed, and our world will never be the same as a result. Never again, no. in so many ways. Here's the latest. The, um, the death toll from Tuesday's attack is expected to, to reach the thousands, but an accurate count um, could take weeks. We, we know that 64 people were aboard the plane that crashed in the Pentagon. We know that 157 people were on the two planes that hit the World Trade Center, and we know that 45 people were on the jet that crashed in Pennsylvania. Beyond that, everything else at this point is is guesswork. U.S. officials are beginning to gather evidence linking the fugitive terrorists Osama bin Laden to the attack. It has been reported that bin Laden praised the people who carried out the attack but denied any involvement. U.S. government is open this morning but all of the nation's airports remain closed. We had heard word earlier they might open by uh, noon today but so far that has not been confirmed. Jim? Let's go to Jim Stewart in Washington who has the very latest for us this morning. Jim, good morning. Good morning, Jane. Uh, law enforcement officials have finish their first strategic meetings of the day and tell us that the most important direction that they are going in right now, <clears throat> excuse me, is to try to locate what they believe to be a cell of colleagues who assisted these hijackers, provided the logistics to allow them to stay in the United States and then board these aircraft. They believe that a certain number of people are here in this country. Search warrants we know have been executed in Broward County, Florida, outside Miami and Davie, Florida, and also in Daytona, Florida. They have seized property including vans and some materials in Boston and in uh, New Jersey. Uh, we are told that uh, apparently wire intercept uh, communication intercepts are leading them to draw up more search warrants as well. Uh, the prevailing theory here is that three to five hijackers were in each of these aircraft. They succeeded by bundling the passengers into the rear of the plane, uh, putting a knife, a small box knife that each apparently carried in their toilet uh, kit aboard the aircraft. Uh, to the throats of the stewardesses, the pilots rushed out to offer assistance, and then one or more of the hijackers seized control of the aircraft. They apparently have some detailed information about what happened aboard each of these aircraft from frantic phone calls made by passengers, some of whom we are now told were encouraged by the hijackers to call their relatives, call authorities, and, and, and spread the news that they had been hijacked. Jane. Jim, agents coming from around the world to assist in this effort, are they not? Uh, they are coming from around the world, and certainly uh, we'll, uh, the FBI is in, in a position right now to take help from wherever it can get it, but basically they believe this is a, a, an investigation that begins here in the United States. The big question for them is how did these people get in the United States? One early indication is some may have come through Canada. That has been a route they have used before. It's being closely looked at today. This is Jane. such an enormous undertaking, Jim. I can't imagine they've ever seen anything like this. Would you agree? No. There, there has not been an investigation like this in the history of the United States. It is unprecedented. Yesterday we saw for the first time the implementation of a plan that was, was to have been executed only in the event of a nuclear war in this country. That is how severe it was. That is how seriously the government is taking what happened.
Jim Stewart in Washington. Jim, thank you. This morning, renewed hope as rescuers are able to pull survivors out of the wreckage of the World Trade Center. Mika Brzezinski is near the crash site in Lower Manhattan. Mika, good morning. Jane, good morning. Here in New York City, it is the day after, and for many here, exhaustion has set in. For crews working the scene, the shock over what has happened hasn't worn off. The devastation you see behind me is the product of war, and it's right here, right now. A day later, the second shifts are headed in. Hopefully save some lives and uh, help to send some people home. And those who got there first headed out. A trauma surgeon who saw his daily duties multiply by the thousands. It's what I do every day. It's just a tiring day, long day, 24 hours. So I'm going to go home. A cop at a loss for words. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. There is nothing left of the view of Tower 1 and Building 7 except a piece of the upper level embedded into the pavement. There used to be 110 floors. There's nothing? You would never tell. You would never tell. You could never tell there was a building there? No. A large portion of Manhattan has been shut down indefinitely. The streets have an eerie, dead feeling. It is an atmosphere so uncharacteristic of a city known to never sleep. New York City is a war zone. As gas lines are plugged and heavy equipment is hauled in, sleep is lost on many on the hunt for life. Many who just couldn't prepare for this. It's, it's a lot of devastation, uh, you know, but we have to deal with it. It's something that we have to do. I mean, nobody really prepares for anything on, on this kind of scale. And, uh, you know, every news you hear is just more and more bad news. And they're still getting more. That firefighter you just heard uh, from told me that it's going to take days to burn out the hotspots. Some of them, they just have to let burn out themselves. And that is one of the many dangers facing the survivors, however many there may be, who are trapped inside. Signs of hope, though, from that firefighter, information from him as he was there throughout the night of those who were pulled out. Two Port Authority cops, who now I've confirmed, did get people to them via cell phone. Another cop and also five, possibly six firefighters pulled out to save and it's information like that that is keeping the exhausted, emotionally distraught crews going because they know they have lost many of their own in this catastrophe. Jane. I can imagine it's quite a, an effort, Mika. Are the streets essentially empty there? People are nowhere to be found. It was, and I can't describe, when I, I walked to the scene, I jogged, it took about 20 minutes to get to where, where I showed you I was at the, the sight line to Tower 1. Nobody on the street. It looked as if a bomb had gone off and everybody was gone. Papers just flying in the air. It was really, uh, it, it doesn't seem like New York City anymore. Mika Brzezinski, thank you very much. 908, Brian. All right, Jane. In Washington, William Cohen is joining us. He's uh, former Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. William Cohen, good morning. Good morning, Brian. In all the um, scenarios you ever drew up at the Pentagon, did you ever imagine anything this horrific? Uh, I didn't Im imagine the specifics uh, of what has taken place, uh, obviously, but we did um, have concerns about uh, the possibility of an aircraft uh, flying overhead the Pentagon. Uh, and uh, landing on the Pentagon, being attacked either uh, with a loss of uh, altitude or fuel by uh, a flight, uh, but also with a terrorist attack. But by virtue of the proximity of um, the Pentagon uh, to the National Airport, it's virtually impossible to protect against that. So it was a nightmare that uh, we lived with um, all during my years there. We took a number of protective measures in terms of having uh, goods and services uh, delivered off-site. Uh, we uh, beefed up security, but this was one of those uh, incidents uh, where we uh, could anticipate it could take place. Mm -hmm. It did, in fact, uh, take place. You're a defense expert. Was what happened yesterday indefensible? Uh, what happened uh, yesterday is uh, indefensible in the sense that uh, one could not defend the Pentagon against such an attack anymore. You could defend the uh, trade towers against such an attack. Uh, but to uh, try to prevent them from taking place in the future, we have to obviously uh, change the way in which you go about security at airports and other means of transportation, but we also have to go to the source, and that is we have to go to those who are supporting these groups who are dedicated to uh, terrorizing and waging war against America. Is that realistic? Could we go to the source? Could we eradicate those who are responsible for this, or will their place simply be taken by others? I think that there will always be others who are uh, going to try to fulfill those, uh, those shoes, but what we have to do is to have a war declared 
prepared and to be joined in that war by so many of our partners, those who are concerned about defending freedom, now is the time for them to join America in its hour of need. And this has to be a worldwide commitment. We have to stamp out those uh, terrorist groups, but also the countries who are lending uh, either moral support, financial support, uh, physical security, anything that they do to support terrorists, uh, make them uh, the enemy S as specifically well. Specifically, what are we talking about? The rogue states of Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, North Korea? Right. Any of the countries who are on the terrorist list, uh, to the extent that they continue to support acts of terrorism, they have to be declared enemies of freedom. Are you suggesting that there are other nations that, while not harboring terrorists, nonetheless uh, show more of a sympathetic view than than you think is justifiable? Well, I think uh, over the years we've looked for support from uh, many of our friends and they have come with varying degrees of uh, intensity in terms of uh, commitment uh, to uh, our cause as such of uh, rooting out and defeating uh, terrorism. That has to change. Uh, we have to have and postulate our own uh, policies toward uh, capitals who are um, uh, theoretically going to support us uh, depending upon the level of their intensity. Uh, we have to alter our re uh, relationship with them. We cannot afford to have countries who profess to be uh, supporters of the United States and our ideals uh, quietly either undermining uh, our activities or criticizing them or failing mm -hmm. to support them. Let me ask you to stay with us for a second while I bring in retired Lieutenant General James Scott, ex-commander of Army Special Operations Command in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and uh, maybe more to the point, a former member of Harvard's Catastrophic Terrorism Task Force. General Scott, good morning. Good morning. Um, we heard the President last night talking about striking back at those who um, who perpetrated these attacks. Um, talk realism for me. Um, is that possible? Well, it certainly is. The, if the political will is present, and hopefully it now is, and public support is present, uh, as Secretary Cohen knows, there are forces available who are entirely capable of striking anywhere. The United States has had global reach for many years and has it, and if the President makes the decision, uh, strikes can be conducted against individuals or groups in any of the aforementioned countries. You, you talk about, uh, about the political will and the, and the public will. Can these strikes be affected, be successful, um, without some loss, some loss of American life? Well, that's been one of the problems in the past. As, uh, as, uh, as we all know, we, uh, we chose to bomb Serbia from 15,000 feet to avoid the potential loss of uh, American pilots and crews. Uh, and unless we are willing to risk our, our own military in conducting counter-terrorist operations, uh, we won't have much success. I do, however, believe that it can be conducted, that such strikes can be conducted with very limited casualties on our part. But it will require some bold action and some planning, and as I can't repeat often enough, the political will to execute it. Talk specifics for me. If we're talking about going into Afghanistan and routing out Osama bin Laden or those who are in partnership with him, um, when you say we have to um, be willing to do what's necessary, are you talking about a manned aircraft? Or are you talking about troops on the ground? I certainly think that both have a uh, have a purpose. I'm not going to go into how I would do it because uh, uh, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about the uh, tactics. Uh, uh, in that detail, except to say that the forces there, air, naval, ground, are available, trained, and ready, and those operations can be conducted with minimum losses of U.S. life. There will be some operational successes and some operational failures, but that's the nature of warfare. William Cohen, do you agree with that? Uh, I do agree with that. I think we have the capability to carry out virtually uh, any type of operation that would be uh, directed against uh, groups or individuals, as the general has indicated. But I want to make one distinction that while uh, we were waging an effective war uh, in Kosovo, uh, an air campaign, uh, it was quite different in terms of the consensus uh, on the part of the American people in the United States Congress. This is different. This is war now having been declared uh, against the United States with massive losses. Uh, that's going to galvanize the American spirit uh, and to generate generate that political will to take whatever action is necessary to deal mm -hmm. with the threat. In general, you talked about the uh, political and public will. Right now, everyone has a degree of bloodlust and is anxious for revenge, but uh, revenge isn't going to come in the next day, probably not even the next week. Do you see this lasting? Do you think that will will exist? Well, I think that the, the uh, distinction that Secretary Cohen made about an act of war versus what we had considered in the past as peripheral terrorism is very key. Uh, remember, from Pearl Harbor to the Japanese surrender in Tokyo Bay was three and a half years of hard fighting. Uh, I consider this an act of war against the United States. 
I think it would, that we will have a determined campaign over a long period of time that will enjoy significant success. But the key, I think, is long period of time. Also remember, we didn't strike back at Japan the day after Pearl Harbor. Uh, we planned operations and conducted them over an extended period of time and uh, brought them to their knees. And uh, so that's what I think yeah. is going to have to happen here. Unfortunately, we were a much more patient population then, I fear. Lieutenant General James T. Scott and uh, former Secretary William Cohen. Gentlemen, both, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. All righty. It's 9.15. Jane? Bright reaction overseas has been, for the most part, supportive of the United States. Tom Fenton is in London this morning with more on that. Tom, good morning. Well, good morning. Uh, there have been a series of bomb scares around the world this morning, and a number of public buildings as well as tall buildings have been evacuated. Security has been tightened at important key installations as governments and people realize that what happened in America could also happen here. One story, one image. Commuters gazed at TV screens as the scenes were carried round the world, chaotically and in measured tones. Doomsday in Manhattan, a terrorist apocalypse. World leaders were steadfast in their support. Even Cuban President Fidel Castro, an old enemy of the United States, expressed his solidarity and condolences. But importantly, Britain's Prime Minister went further. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy. And we, like them, will not rest until this evil is driven from our world. Former Israeli leader Ehud Barak was unequivocal in his demand that terrorism be stamped out. Uh, whoever is ready to host these kind of activities should be automatically isolated from the community of nations. The Taliban regime in Afghanistan, which harbors the chief suspect Osama bin Laden, rushed to deny that he could have had anything to do with it. But one man who has met him thinks differently. The attacks against the uh, Trade Center and the Pentagon uh, is uh, typically uh, called for. Uh, it, it is actually uh, indicating that, that he called for this. He wants to hurt the American. Uh, he wants to strike inside the United States, in the heart of the United States, to make the administration suffer. Steadfast support was also being tempered with reality in stock markets, which dropped sharply as they opened round the world. Therefore, their aim was to attack the economy, to attack capitalism, and to declare that it is their enemy, and they're going to destroy it. Well, America's armed forces around the world have been placed on the highest state of alert short of actual war, threat condition Delta, and America's allies are asking, Val, what action will the United States government take? All right, Tom Fenton, thank you. As Tom said, international stock markets overnight dipped sharply in the wake of the attacks. Barry Peterson is in Tokyo this morning with more on that. Barry, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Well, as you might expect, fear led to falling stock prices. Hong Kong down 9%, Singapore off 7%, and Tokyo, the biggest market of all, down 6.6%. And like people elsewhere in the world, people here in Asia were stunned and disbelieving. Condolences were offered by Asian governments and by ordinary people who showed up at the U.S. Embassy here in Tokyo to somehow express their grief. The U.S. Embassy was one of several closed in Asia, and U.S. officials warned Americans in Japan to, quote, review their personal security. At the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, extra security was rapidly provided by the government there. U.S. forces in Asia were quick to respond. The amphibious assault ship Essex making its way out of port. More sailors and soldiers who were on leave were called back to their bases. Security was stepped up at all military installations across the region. There are about 100,000 U.S. troops in Asia. Helping out here in Japan, extra security provided by Japanese police. Strong words of support from Japan's prime minister, who called the attack extremely vicious and unforgivable. He also assured the Japanese people in a nationwide address that Japan stands ready to do anything necessary to prevent a global financial crisis. Japan has already taken some steps during this trading day. The country poured an extra $16 billion into banks here. The Japanese want to make sure that there is enough cash to keep the markets operating. Jane? Barry Peterson in Tokyo. Barry, thank you.
What happened yesterday is inexplicable, and so many people are waking up this morning still asking why. In Los Angeles, Robert Butterworth is a clinical psychologist who specializes in helping people deal with grief and trauma. Mr. Butterworth, good morning. Good morning, Jane. A nation in shock this morning. How, what's, is there a response that's normal? I, I, in something like this, I think the response is trying to just push away from being numb and, and trying to put that one foot in front of the other and realize that in spite of the fact that it's a new reality, we have to move on. We can't let this stop us. It, they've attacked us from the outside in, but we can't allow it from the inside out. We have to keep that spirit, and I think that's happening now. You see these images over and over again, and new ones coming in every minute. I mean, watching this on television, it seems overwhelming to know that, that this is us. This is the United States. This is happening here. And you know, that's really what the definition of post-traumatic stress is. The images occur, and after the event, the images continue to occur, and the memories remain with us. And, and that's, that's, this, that's the legacy of this. This is one of those things that we won't forget. We're all going to remember where we were. And psychologically, I, I think we've lost our innocence as, as a country that was, we had that perception that we were safe. You talk about that post-traumatic stress. Uh, that many people feel. I mean, I, for one, couldn't get so many images out of my mind last night as I tried to sleep. I mean, how do you go forward from here, Dr. Butterworth? Well, I think for the first few days, we have to let people know that it's normal to feel what you're feeling. It's normal not to be able to concentrate. It's normal to have trouble sleeping. And it's normal to feel a little bit uneasy when you go in a large group. As the days go on, however, let's hope that we're able to move away from that. And, and sadly, those people that have lost loved ones will never forget, but let's hope that the people that are, that are away from that can at least go on with their lives because we understand and we know that being going back to routine, trying to be, go back to normal habits is the best remedy to go back to uh, feeling back to the way we were two days ago. For, for those of us who are older, for adults, um, it may be easier than for the children who are seeing these images on TV. How do you, how do you explain to a child what has happened here? Well, for the young ones under five, it's almost impossible. These are kids that really don't understand, and it's probably better to shield them. But for those kids that are going to school, I think it's a parent's duty to sit down and talk to them about what happened. You, you can't hide this from them. I mean, kids are exposed to this in school. They're talking about it with their friends. And you, sadly, as a parent, have to break the news that the world is not a safe place. And, and sadly, the world that they're into, uh, it, it, it can, bad things can happen. Are there it's specific, a sad thing to do. Are there do. specific things you should say, Dr. Butterworth, to a child? I think we first of all have to let the child understand that it happened in a place that may be not where they're living and to give them a sense of geographical sophistication and also let them realize that the, those buildings that were bombed are not our houses. The children have to have a sense of safety. They have to feel that where they're going to school and, and possibly where they're sleeping is not under attack. Those small steps will help children and again with our teachers will hopefully get through this. We've gone through a lot of tragedies before and we've, we've come out, you know, uh, healed and let's hope we can begin anew with this. You talk about the loss of innocence. Certainly that is true. I mean, this affects a nation's psyche forever. And, and indeed, for those images that we've seen, it will be there forever. But, you know, as a nation, you know, unlike a lot of countries, we're, we're, we're a country that's open. We're a country that's generous. And, and sadly, we're a country that's forgiving. And let's hope that this doesn't really change not only the psyche of, of, of all of us, but the collective psyche of America. So many people are affected by this, Dr. Butterworth, thousands and thousands of people. For those who have lost a loved one, for those who know someone who has lost a loved one, what do you recommend? In the short term, I think you just have to get together with loved ones and begin to heal and try to get support from whomever you can. The long term, as we know from Oklahoma City, sadly, this is a long process, weeks, months, years. It, it leaves an indelible mark, and, and hopefully these therapists that are out there now will not forget New York in months to come, because people are going to need help, not today, not tomorrow, maybe not next month, but for years to come. Because the truth is, again, you never really recover. You never really forget. Robert Butterworth, my thanks to you in Los Angeles today very much. Thank you, Jane.
It is 924 Eastern Time. Some viewers will cut away now for local news. We'll continue with our special coverage of an attack on America after this. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carrie Connolly, joined with Scott Wally here in our WBZ4 studios. Thanks for joining us. Our local coverage continues this morning. We do uh, have new information coming out of Logan Airport, which is closed today, along with all the other airports across the country. As you can imagine, MBTA and Amtrak running on schedule, though. Dan Ray's down at the Hyatt at uh, Logan Airport. Massport's going to be holding a news conference. Uh, well, Dan, you can tell us exactly when. What will we learn this morning from Massport? Well, good morning once again, Scott and Kerry. Uh, Massport is going to be delaying their news conference. Apparently, the uh, Bush administration and Secretary of Transportation, Norman Mineta, will be holding a news conference perhaps as early as within the hour down in Washington, D.C. And Massport's uh, attitude here is they do not want to step uh, on anything that he's going to say in terms of when airports across the country, or for that matter, up or down the East Coast corridor, will open. What I have confirmed uh, in the uh, last hour or so is that indeed, uh, there was a vehicle seized here at Logan Airport uh, late yesterday, uh, described to me as a white Mitsubishi. It was a national car rental, uh, and that vehicle was seized inside the main parking garage here at Logan Airport. Inside that vehicle, there were items found which the FBI now believes was linked to the people who left Boston and commandeered the planes that eventually crashed into those two uh, towers in New York City yesterday. Uh, the understanding is that the people who came here, they believe, came across the Canadian border uh, and then came here early yesterday morning on a American Eagle commuter flight from Portland in here to Boston's Logan Airport. Uh, now, again, I'm not familiar with the logistics of the American Airlines terminal, and so it is possible, uh, I, I stress possible at this point, that the People involved here could have cleared, uh, gotten their clearance uh, through security in Maine, and if they had landed inside an area where they were transferring planes within a terminal, they may not have had to have cleared uh, security twice. Uh, but again, I do not know exactly where the American Eagle flight would have landed, but the bottom line is that at this point, uh, the investigation is intensifying here at Logan Airport and that there's a quite a good deal of information. We also know that there have been some search warrants executed uh, several reports uh, now of search warrants being executed on homes in the Florida area. So this conspiracy uh, certainly stretched up and down the East Coast at a minimum and obviously was uh, orchestrated probably from somewhere outside of the country. We'll continue to try to work the investigation here and also stand by for the Massport News Conference, but that will not happen until Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta uh, has a chance to meet with the media in Washington. For now, Dan Ray, live at Logan Airport. Back to you, Scott and Kerry. All right, Dan Ray, thank you. Well, uh, we do have new information on the list of uh, people on board the two planes, American Airlines Flight 11, also United Airlines Flight 175. We have some additional names to the ones we've uh, read earlier in the, this morning. Uh, let's begin at the top with Ken Waldy, a Raytheon employee from Methuen. Another Raytheon employee, Peter Gay from Andover. Richard Ross, 58 years old. He ran a consulting firm in Newton. Neely Casey of Wellesley. And Mark Babis, who played hockey under Jackie Parker at uh, Boston University, a BU grad from Providence, and uh, a longtime scout for the Los Angeles Kings. Another hockey player, Scott Garnett, Ace Bailey, 53 years old, of Linfield, the director of pro scouting for the Los Angeles Kings hockey team. He was also a form former Boston Bruins player. David and Lynn Angel. He was the executive producer of the NBC TV show Frasier. The couple was returning from their home in Chatham. Also, Daniel Lewin, 31 years old, the co-founder of Akamai Technologies in Cambridge. Brian Sweeney, 38 years old, of Barnstable, and Jane Orth, 49, of Haverhill. John Cahill of Wellesley, the pilots of American Flight 11. Tom McGinnis of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the uh, pilot John Oganowski of Drake. Tara Creamer of Worcester and Ted Hennessy from Belmont. And Peter, Susan, and their little girl, Christine Hansen, only two years old, from Massachusetts. Also, Charles Jones of Bedford, Bill Weems of Marblehead, and David Retnick of Needham. And added to the list, uh, Robin Kaplan, uh, Anna Williams Allison, Jeffrey Coombs, Thelma Cuccinello, Alex Philippoff, Paige Farley Hackle, 
and added to the list David DiMeglio of Wakefield, uh, Carlton D.B. Fife of Brookline, Chris Mello of Boston, Laura Lee, Laura Beto of Framingham, and Louis Neal Mariani of Derry, New Hampshire. And of course, that is not a complete list. We will continue to update you as soon as we get more information throughout the morning. So we do want to head back to New York City, Scott, where they continue their coverage from the early show. We'll see you later this hour.